Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Lyle, and I am an alcoholic. Need to get the thank yous out of the way. First of all, J.J. picked me up in uh, Omaha and um, drove me here. We had a lot of conversation. He'll drive me back tomorrow. Uh, Will was the first gent who got in touch with me and has stayed in touch with me throughout this whole thing. Uh, <clears throat> you met the committees and the volunteers. They're the ones who do the heavy lifting on this deal. Speakers come in. You know, we take a weekend off and jump in the airplane and come up here and talk. But it's the committee members and all the volunteers that really are the backbone of this entire thing that allow us to do what we're doing here this weekend. And they're the ones who get the credit for all of this. Um, I'm grateful to be here. Um, I try never to offend an audience, um, and I don't want to do that tonight. There are a number of Native people here tonight, and um, they always add a special dimension uh, to any gathering that I'm at, because I grew up in that community, and I didn't see much sobriety there when I was growing up. And so when I see Native people who come up to me and I talk with them, I thank them, and I'm always touched. I feel honored that they would be here, and I respect and admire their sobriety among the Native communities more than I can tell you. So thank you for being here tonight. I... <clears throat> I give a bit of a different talk when I'm at a native event than I will tonight. This is my Daivo version. That means white people in Comanche. <laughs> so, I always like it when at some of these big conventions they have people that are doing the American Sign Language. And I say, I want to watch this when I throw out a Comanche word or two and see what they do with that. <laughs> My sobriety date is uh, March 7th of 1990, so I've been around a little bit. <laughs> My home group is the Stockbridge Group in Stockbridge, Georgia, and uh, we meet Mondays and Thursday nights, and you're always welcome if you're in that area. It was uh, kind of funny. I was looking at the program, and I was looking at Terry and Brenda, and it said, Why Zeta, Minnesota? And I lived in the Twin Cities for about eight years. I go, they misspelled it. It's w they got W-A-Y-S, and it's W-A-Y-Z. Not that it's a big deal, but <laughs> well, it's not. But a couple of years ago, I went through a whole spell where I was showing up at these conferences, and they had me down from <clears throat> Stonebridge, Georgia, um, Stockton, Georgia, and other places, uh, but the best of all of those um, iterations was when I was in England, and they had me down from Stocking Bridge, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the Brits were a little confused by that, and they go, where is Stocking Bridge, Georgia? And I said, it's just across the state line from Pantyhose, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I have to tell you that, that I think, when I hear that, I think one of the greatest gifts that we have ever been given is the gift of laughter. You know, I see this up here, the theme, we're not a glum lot. And the, the thing that's so striking about that is I have never met a person ever who has come into their first AA meeting that was smiling, laughing, happy, glad to be there. <laughs> Somebody once used the phrase, and I thought, man, that's a poor choice of words. They said, we do not fly in here on the wings of victory. And I thought, God, can you use a different phrase than that? That's a <laughs> <clears throat> but we don't. And it was a long time before I could smile or be happy. And this gift of laughter, this whole healthy healing laughter that we get to experience tonight like we just did, is a priceless gift. And, and, and we pay dearly for that. And we have to earn it through our efforts in this program and this fellowship. I'll, uh, my talk will center mostly around three days, my last three days of drinking, March 7th, 8th, and 9th of 1990. 
And those are 90, well, let's see, 72 hours. 72 hours of of living that I never want to I never want to experience again. And because I talk about it, they stay fresh. And every year when March 7th, 8th, and 9th rolled around, the intensity must have lessened in 26 years, but it doesn't feel like it very much. And I can look at my watch, and I know where I was at that moment on that particular day. It's kind of like, you know, these frozen in time moments like the Kennedy assassination when people know. I, I've got three days of that, and I really don't ever want to forget that. And through each, every time those days cycle through, I'm, I'm absolutely immersed in this gratitude that it's now and not then. I will, you know, we're supposed to talk about uh, what we were like, what happened, and what we're like now. <clears throat> and I usually mix the order up a little bit, and I start with what happened because it was a huge deal. It was mega huge. Um, on March the 8th of 1990, early in the morning, an event took place that uh, the public had never seen or heard of before, and that is an airline crew was arrested for having flown from Fargo, North Dakota, to the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul International Airport, and I was the captain of that flight crew. You know, I've watched this happen probably several dozen times since then, you see, but it's old hat news now. I was the first pilot that this had ever occurred to in this whole as this whole story unfolds. But you now you'll see a pilot who gets stopped going through TSA, smells like alcohol, flunks the test. And, but on day two, he's gone. You don't see him on the second news cycle. But when I was the first one that this occurred to, this was sensational uh, me, uh, grist for the media. And I stayed on the news for weeks into months, and I thought it would never go away. I thought it was never going to end. I remember having a thought one time that I thought, man, I don't think Pearl Harbor got this much coverage. <laughs> <laughs> and every time it came on, it was just like a knife going right through my guts, my intestines. I, and because I wasn't supposed, this wasn't supposed to happen to me. You know, I, I listen to our stories because I get around like some of the other folks do, and I hear these stories, and they're they're widely diverse. All of them are different. And I've thought to myself, if I was a newcomer sitting out there, I've got exactly the material I need to get up and walk out here and say, that isn't me, because I'm listening for differences. And at 26 and a half years sober, I hear lots of differences still. I, none of my drinking, none of my stuff fits the speakers that we've had yet. Uh, today, this uh, through this event, you know, I go, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't do that either. But that's not what I'm listening for. What I'm listening for is what this disease does to the people who are up here, where it takes them, no matter how the facts and circumstances, some more exciting than others, but what it does to the person who's standing here at the podium, the loss, the shame, the devastation, the destruction, the loss of self, the damage to families and friends. And then I listen for the recovery part of it, and I hear that every single time too. The upward climb, the things that begin to happen as a result of this program and this fellowship, and where these people end up as a result. And I hear my story in that process each and every time. I don't care how young, how old, red, white, yellow, or black, female, male, female, I hear my story when I'm listening in that context. Now, I also know that most of the time, nearly all the time, speakers come up and they leave, and we don't know what they did for a living because it's not relevant to the story of recovery. That's not what up they're up here to talk about. So I want to tell you right now that the only reason I'm talking about the airline pilot thing is because it was a central core part of the story. It was the thing that generated... All of the news coverage, it was the thing that set me up for a federal felony conviction and a prison term. That if I had been a doctor, an attorney, an electrician, a plumber, an office worker, anywhere, none of those things would have occurred. Not one of them. But because of the profession I was in, they all occurred. And so it's in the context of the story and that particular aspect of it that I talk about being an airline pilot. And that only. I don't believe... We have any special status in this program or this fellowship. I've always felt that way. I don't care if you own the finest home here in Sioux City or you just came out a week ago from a cardboard condo under a box. 
the thing that binds us and holds all of us, all of us in this room together, is that strong fiber called sobriety. And that's the thing we all achieve, we strive for and we achieve, and it makes all of us equal. And that's that's always been my belief. And until I get an email that says we just broke ground on the AA Hall of Fame, <laughs> I, <clears throat> I know there are a few people who think they belong there. I've met them. <laughs> I will continue to think that the only thing that we strive and achieve here is that blessed, priceless, golden gift called sobriety. On that morning of March the 8th, I walked off the airplane in uniform with four stripes on, and I saw two airport policemen, I saw FAA officials, and I saw Northwest Airlines officials. And I could leave my airline anonymous, and I hope by the time this is over, you'll understand why I don't do that. But at that moment, that moment, I knew that my life had ended. And the thing that I experienced more than anything else, all-consuming, totally penetrating, shame, disgrace, and dishonor that went to my very bone marrow. I used to spend some time, I thought it was important for me to convey to you exactly what I meant by that. And the big book says it in a very short and succinct way when it talks about pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I don't think it can be said any better than that. And I experienced that and more because that wasn't the way I'd lived my life. That was not who I was. And my life wasn't supposed to end like this. But I'm an alcoholic. And things happen to me that happen to all alcoholics sooner or later. Northwest Airlines at that time was the only major carrier that didn't have a program for alcoholic pilots. All the other major carriers had that, those programs, and they dated back to the mid-'70s. They were highly, highly successful. They boast an average success rate of 88 to 92 percent, and beautifully successful programs. But Northwest had, had refused to go along with that. And every few years, <clears throat> I would see a pilot who would get in trouble on a layover, and if it reached the company's attention, I knew the outcome. We all knew the outcome. It was swift. It was severe. They were terminated. They never came back. And their names and those stories ripped through the airline like wildfire among the pilots and flight attendants. And we heard about those stories. And I had a little list up here, my little hall of shame of the names that I recalled and the locales and the details of the stories that they had generated. <clears throat> and over the course of that day, the 12 hours we were detained, the millions of thoughts that I had, one of them that probably hurt the most was that's my legacy. That's how I leave this airline. And it wasn't supposed to happen like that. I'm going to talk about two parents who were alcoholics who died from this disease. But I never go to the podium without thanking my parents for the good things they gave us, my sister and I, who was two years younger, before the alcohol killed them. They gave me some good stuff, and they taught me some good things. And one of the things they taught me was I was always to do my best, no matter what the endeavor was, no matter what the job was, how menial or how great it was. I was always to do my best. And I was always supposed to leave anything that I was involved with bright and shiny, with dignity on it, and personal pride of, of, my, of a job well done. That's what I've been taught to do. If I had an 8-to-5 job, I was supposed to show up at 745 and I don't leave until 5.15, and while I'm there, I work harder than you do. That's what I was taught, and that's where I had put the thrust of my life. And suddenly, everything's upside down, and this wasn't supposed to happen to me, but it did. I spent <clears throat> much of that day looking around the room, sometimes feeling suspended, like this was so surreal, this couldn't be happening to me, and I'm watching it happen to someone else. It can't be happening to me. And then I would look around, and the reality would hit, and I would have to, th I would have to fight to keep from vomiting, keep, keep from getting sick, because this was happening. It was happening to me right now. We were detained. We went to two different facilities where we gave blood, and it was at the second facility that there was a reporter who happened to see him, two uniformed cops and three uniformed pilots, and he thought there might be a story, and that's how it broke to the public. I had no idea at that moment in time that it was going public. The mere idea that it was going through Northwest Airlines devastated me. 
broke me. I had no idea it was going to reach the public. It was going to go all over the United States and stay there. It was going to Canada. It was going to Asia and to Europe, and I'd hear from people over there. I had no idea that was about to occur. We gave sworn depositions and a testimony to company attorneys. We talked with Airline Pilot Association attorneys, and much of the day is a blur, and some of it is almost a blackout. I'd, it's just I, the trauma was so great that I had trouble recalling certain parts of it. I got back to the commuter apartment that night, and for the first time it occurred to me I'm supposed to be home tonight. Barbara waited at the Atlanta airport for four hours, and I never showed up. And I made the phone call home, and my she's still at the airport, and I heard my voice in the answering machine. Didn't know what. I, and I left a very whispered, defeated message. I said, there's been a disaster. I think I've lost my job, and I'll be home the first flight in the morning. Four hours later, Barbara went home after I didn't never showed up. I don't know why she didn't call me back, <clears throat> having received a message like that, but I was grateful for that because I was so sick. So sick at heart, I did not want to talk about it. And I can't believe she didn't call me back after having received a message like that. I got into Atlanta on the first flight, and the next morning exited the airport as quickly as I could because I knew everybody out there. I knew the baggage handlers and the groomers, mechanics, all the ground personnel people used to laugh and joke and kid with them. And I didn't want anybody to see me, stop me, or say anything to me. So I exited real as fast as I could. I got to the front of the airport. I knew I, would, I was in uniform. I knew I'd never wear that uniform again, ever. And I walked to the front of the airport, and I've never told a story. And what I haven't said, Barbara was parked off to the right, and I felt like I had to climb over the curb to get in the car with her, and I couldn't look at her. This is now March the 9th. It's a Friday. We've been married a long time. She pulled away from the curb, and I said, Honey, I'm so sorry. She's got a soft South Texas voice. <laughs> Very softly, she said, who better than I might possibly understand how you feel right now? And we drove home in silence. Again, another gift that I didn't see her recognize for some time, but I thought later, what wife, having learned that her husband had just trashed a 22-year golden career as an airline captain, would not have said, why did you stay? You knew the Northwest policy. You've seen this before. Why didn't you go back to your hotel room? She had a right to every one of those questions, and I didn't have an answer for one of them. But she never asked. We got home. <clears throat> she went to work. I went inside the house. Could not stay still. I did not want to be in my skin. Everything felt like it was crawling and moving inside of me. And within minutes, I picked the phone up, and I called the only person I knew to call at that moment in time. He's a Ph.D. family therapist. And I said, I need to declare an emergency. I need to come in and see you right away. He said, I'll clear the calendar. Come in. I went in. And I look back and I think, if there was a good thing about what had happened, this was it. It had broken me. This was the final coup de grace. I was done. I was through. I knew it. And so I went in and I told him straight out what had happened. <clears throat> and I'm going to hear two comments on this particular day, neither one of which I can mentally process. And I just told him straight out what had happened. And he pulled back and he, got, he was surprised and shocked. And he said, God, Lyle, he said, this is horrible. He said, this is absolutely horrible. And I heard the first comment. He started around his desk and he turned to his left and he looked at me. And he said, but maybe this is what had to happen. I could not understand why he would say that to me. I did not know what that had to do with anything or why he would say that to me. And he left and he came back a few minutes later and he said, I've just talked to a doctor I was on staff with a few years ago. He's a brilliant doctor. And he said, I want to see, he wants to see you at 6 o'clock tonight. And um, he's a recovering alcoholic and cocaine addict. He's a psychiatrist and he's certified in addiction medicine. I d did not know there was any such thing as addiction medicine. Now, I did pick up, in, 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 in spite of the condition I was in, I was completely shredded mentally and emotionally. But I picked up on the fact that doctors don't see patients at 6 o'clock on Fridays. I knew that. So this, this conveyed a certain sense of urgency to me. 
later, this doctor told me, <clears throat> he said, based on your appearance, he said, I was so afraid you were a suicide. And he said it was Im imperative that you get over and see this man right away. And I thought, you know, I don't know what I looked like or sounded like, but I'm, I'm starting to have some pretty dark thoughts. So Barbara and I drove across town to see this man, and um, um, it was dark. And I don't recall anything about that meeting. I hadn't had anything to eat or drink for two days. But that meeting is very much like an alcoholic blackout, and I've had a lot of those. And what I knew, do know is that whatever time I was there, I don't know if I was there 15 minutes or 45 minutes, whatever it was he asked me, I gave him a straight, honest answer as best I could. At some point during that interview, <clears throat> he turned and he looked at me and said, Lyle, he said, you're an alcoholic and you need to get into treatment tonight. I didn't react to that. That was significant because I've hated alcoholics all my life. I've hated them since I saw what happened in my family with two alcoholic parents when that finally killed the family, destroyed the family. I saw it in my native community. I saw it in the towns and cities when I flew around the United States. Alcoholics laying in alleyways, drinking dirty, drinking out of brown paper bags, sometimes in the doorways, passed out, laying on the park grass, sometimes on benches. Those were alcoholics. Now, I wasn't an alcoholic. But in the 24 hours since the arrest, in a way I will never understand, way down here, those dots got connected. And I knew that I was that thing that I swore to God I would never be. I knew that my life was gone because I'm an alcoholic. That when I start drinking, I don't seem to be able to quit. And <clears throat> so I didn't have a reaction to that. But I said to him, I just got home today. And I said, please. Let me go home. I said, I'd like for Barbara to just hang on to me, hold on to me. Let my mind uncoil. Let me absorb what's happened. And now I'll go into treatment. He said, you need to go into treatment tonight. And I took a breath, and I looked at him. I said, okay. So we drove back across town, following a set of directions, to a treatment center that's three miles, two and a half miles from the Atlanta airport. I had no idea it was there. I had no reason to know anything about it. And we made the final turn there, and there was a sign on the corner. It's, there's a sign there now. It's a different sign. But the headlights hit that sign. It was right in front of me. It hit the brakes. It said Anchor Hospital, a hospital for alcoholism and other chemical dependencies. The reading, the words, and the sign are in front of me, and another dimension of reality hit me. And I thought, my God Almighty, what happened? My life ends tonight in a treatment center for alcoholism. What happened? And I had a little quick mini flashback over some of the really neat points in my life, the achievements, most of them against the odds, that I held on to. These were treasured moments. These were trophy moments that gave me a dimension, a meaning, and a, a reputation that I was proud of. And they vanished. It was, I wasn't even sure they'd ever been there. And I sat there with zero feeling as a human being. I had no value. I, d I didn't count. I had no self-worth, no value as a human being. Uh, some years later, I read a summarizing paragraph <clears throat> at the end of a long report that a doctor had written. that said, given the history and background of this man, it was unlikely to believe he would ever be a productive member of society. And I thought, man, that's pretty dismal. And... Um, and that was followed by the second thought was, well, I was the one that gave him all the information. And <laughs> <clears throat> we started down the hill in the treatment center. For the first time that day, with the treatment center down there at the end of the hill, I saw it. I thought, this is March the 9th. This is my 27th wedding anniversary. And I said to Barbara, Hell of a way it's been an anniversary, huh? Very softly, I then heard the second statement that I couldn't process. She said, it might be the best one we ever had. And I thought, who could think that right now? There's no question that my life is over. I've seen this before, and the other situations that involved these other pilots wasn't even 10% of what I was experiencing. There is no coming back from this. There will be no coming back, period. I know it. 
It's over. It's done. And there's no question. How could she manufacture a thought like that at a moment like this? I was grateful she did, but I couldn't respond. And I'd like to kind of interrupt this right now and tell you that a few years ago, March and I throwed around. It's a gorgeous Georgia morning, about 9 in the morning, and up this long driveway where we live came one of my sponsees, surprising me. He said, I've heard the story. It's March the 9th. I know it's your anniversary. I thought I'd just come by and wish you and Barbara a happy anniversary. And I said, well, come on in. So Barbara had coffee going. And we go inside, and everything's light and lively. And at some point, he goes, well, he said, what's the secret for having stayed married so long? And before I had a chance to respond, Barbara said, I think it's mostly due to the fact that I could never stand to admit I made a mistake. <laughs> One of the mistakes I made was telling her that this is an ego deflating program, and she considers that her primary responsibility. <laughs> and a couple of years ago, I was speaking at Whitworth Women's Prison, about three hours away from my home in Atlanta, the Stockbridge area where I live, and. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to women's prison. That's a pretty unique experience. And it's uh, the ladies, there are about 25 or 30 of them out there. They don't look, I'm looking at you gals, and they don't look like you look. They've got oversized khaki scrubs, no makeup, usually the hair's a mess. Some of them got tattoos and body piercings. It's a pretty hard looking bunch of ladies. And I'm going through the story, and all of a sudden, one of them yells out, You're hot. <laughs> I've never had that happen before. It just stopped me right in my tracks. <clears throat> and I'm looking, and before I can get re reacclimated, about two or three more yell out, yeah, you're hot. <laughs> it's a women's prison now, remember. <laughs> and by the time I get home, it's about midnight or one in the morning. Barbara's in bed. So we're up the next morning having coffee, and I thought, she probably ought to hear about this. And uh, <laughs> So I tell her about it, and she takes a sip of coffee and looks at me. She says, they must have been locked up a long time. <laughs> I, uh, I was born September 29th. 1938, so in five days I hit 78. It's um, not a big deal, it's just a big number got here awfully fast, and um, I always get that out of the way because I know that there are many like me that sit in the audience and try to figure out the age of the speaker, and uh, <laughs> usually it'll happen. I can figure it out, so they'll drop a couple of deals now. We were just treated a little while ago by Jermaine's talk, and usually, I always say the women AA and Al-Anon speakers are devious, because they won't tell you, and they, they, but they will mask it and throw little cookie crumbs out, and they'll say something like, I graduated from college, I'm thinking, okay, she's 21 or 22, the same year that Kennedy was assassinated, and I'm going, that's 63 minus 21 or 22. <laughs> Or she'll say, I had my first child when I was 24. It was two years after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I'm going, was that 68 or 69? So now i got to add subtract. And uh, they leave, and I'm going, I, I don't know, she's either 45 or 68. I'm not sure. <laughs> <clears throat> but Jermaine came up here, and she dropped two numbers, 27 and 39. And boom, I had you. So... I thought, well, that takes all the fun out of it. I got a whole talk now, and I even already know how old she is. So I can quit, quit, quit doing the detective work. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I grew up in a um, World War II uh, housing project on the southeast edge of Wichita called Plainview. Not a very pretty place, but I'll tell you. And it was an economically depressed area. Poor is a very subjective term. You know, I, I wasn't poor by some of the standards I've seen. I've been on some of the reservations and other places, and I, I go, we were not poor by those standards. But we never had anything. And we were always, my parents were always high, behind and scrambling. Everything we owned was third-rate, broken, patched, tape wired, you know, or something like that. But i, I got to tell you that it was a great place for me to grow up. That was some of my, my happiest childhood memories are growing up in Plainview. 
And next month, about two weeks, I go back from my 60th high school reunion with a bunch of people. That We had a great time. At that time, there were no drive-by shootings. We didn't have gangs out there. Yeah, it wasn't a very pretty place, and we, but we were all the same uh, economically. And I loved growing up there. And it was a very diverse community, whites, blacks, Hispanics, and a few, uh, a, so, a small Native American segment. And I was part of the Native American segment. We all got along. Rarely were the cops called. Rarely was there any difficulty out there. It was a good place and a good time to grow up. And I'm a, ethnically, I'm a mix of several different things. You know, we don't get to go out and pick our parents. And I'm, so I'm an ethnic mix of several different things, but the two that always seem to like to drink the most are the Irish and Comanche parts. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and so, and I'm, you know, I'm okay with that. I, I don't have any choice over it. I was okay with it. And I, I love that Irish music, that raucous, rebellious freedom songs. And I had the albums, and I knew the songs. And when I was flying around the country, I knew where those live Irish bands were, whether I was in Washington, D.C., Boston, Chicago, or wherever. And I could change clothes, and within 20 minutes, I was in one of those places, listening to this authentic live Irish music, and I'm singing along with it. And I would literally be, not leave until the band shut down, and they're going out the door, and I'm going out the door with the band. I love those places. And then other times, maybe the mood was different, or I was in a different place. Um, something was going on, and I would have these other side thoughts about, you know, I think tonight I'll just have a few drinks and go out and kill some white people. And <laughs> I always hoped it didn't kick in when I was in Billings, Montana, those cowboy bars and some of those places that were there. <laughs> I grew up in my culture. I was active in the Native American segment. I was a dancer. I was, a, I was very active in the powwows and the songs and the traditions and all of that other stuff, and I last lost that along the way, and I've returned to it since getting sober. I'm active in Native American sobriety programs around the country, some of them, and um, I'm always amazed, surprised, and, and proud and happy to be there because I saw none of that when I was growing up. When I was 14, the alcoholism had finally done its thing with my parents, and they got their first divorce. And some really bad, nasty things happened in the family. And I was fortunate that we didn't have any domestic violence. And there wasn't a lot of screaming and yelling. But there was that always that palpable undercurrent that is in an alcoholic home. Things were not right. I knew they weren't right. I didn't know what was going to happen next. I couldn't take friends over to my house because one of my parents would be drunk and I'd be embarrassed and ashamed. So they get their first divorce. I'm 14. Within three years, each of them had been married and, married and divorced two more times. I didn't fit into these blended families very well. I had I had got into fights and clashes with stepbrothers and stepsisters. I don't remember any of them. Wouldn't know them if they were in the room tonight. And so I'd be asked to go over here to the other family. So I'd go over there for a while until something happened there, and then I'd bounce back here. Names had changed. Faces had changed. And that's how I kind of went through high school. Uh, as I was getting ready to graduate from high school, not too many people went to college from the area I came from, and uh, I had decided I was going to join service but didn't know what. And about that time, one of my buddies came back from um, uh, Marine Corps boot camp, and I was really impressed. So he and I sat in a bar for about three hours one afternoon, when he and I listened to these grim, sadistic, brutal stories of what Marine drill instructors do to their recruits. And it's probably an early sign of bad thinking because I thought, I'm 18, I just turned 18. And I thought, man, I just can't wait to go do that. And so within a couple of days, I had found a recruiter signed on the line, and off I go into the Marine Corps. I hear a lot of stories, a lot of speakers. Uh, there are two things that uh, pop up quite often. It's true for the people I tell you. It won't be true in my story. I never fit in, and the minute I took that first drink, the magic happened. Not true for me. Neither one of those things are true for me. I went into the Marine Corps, and um, once I got over the initial shock, um, I knew where I belonged. I loved it. It was intense. It was extreme. There's no other experience like Marine Corps boot camp. And I snapped into it pretty quick. There were 70 of us and 13 weeks, and I, I was loving it. I, I thought, this is exactly what I want to do. And at the end of the 13 weeks, the drill instructors called out three names of the, of the 70 of us. And my, of the three top guys, my name was the second name called. I was amazed. I was, I was satisfied just to finish complete and not get set back or eliminated along the way. But I get a PFC strike, private first class. That's not much. But I could not take my eyes off that red-bordered strike. 
Man, because I got 67 of my buddies that are slick sleeve privates, and that strike means something. We went to Camp Pendleton and drew guard duty. I was inside of Quonset as acting corporal of the guard there out in the rain with rifles on their shoulders walking post. And I looked over, and there was a first lieutenant's uniform hanging up, silver bar over there. And I thought, man, at the rate I'm going, general can't be that far away. <laughs> so I'm staying. And I did. <clears throat> You're not going to get a drunk log out of me because I've got a timer up here. I'm trying to watch the time, and I don't have much time. Uh, two hours and 23 minutes. And, um, <laughs> the, um, so I don't, I don't have time for a long drunk log. But my drunk log follows a pattern of almost everybody's I hear. I drank too much, too long. Things happened to me. I had a lot of blackouts. I woke up in places I didn't know where I was. I got in fights. I lost cars. I had two uh, DWIs in Minnesota when I was living there. Um, and I loved it because one of my good Indian buddies said he was in court for his sixth DWI before he learned that did not stand for drinking with Indians. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and uh, <clears throat> the um, um, at any rate. My drinking progressed, and but I'm always in a hard drinking environment for a long time. You know, I'm with a bunch of Marines. Later, I'm a fighter pilot. Later, I'm an airline pilot. And so I'm always in a, in a crowd where it's hard to pull me away from the, from the rest of the group. Eventually, I pull away, but it takes a while. This is a chronic progressive disease. We don't all progress at the same rate. And I'm pretty familiar with the disease, even a lot of the detailed medical aspects of it. But I, I got there. Four and a half years into my Marine Corps journey, my commanding officer called me into his office one day and said, there's a new program out called Marine Aviation Cadet. He said, you're the only man in the unit whose entry scores are high enough to possibly go test for that program. I knew I had high scores. It's amazing to me they were there. I don't know how they got there, but I knew they were there. And <clears throat> I had always wanted to fly. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> Fighting a cough here. I had always wanted to fly, but that was never re very reality-based. <clears throat> the people that I knew that got to fly all had college educations. I'm a marginal high school grad. They also came from good families in different parts of Wichita. They didn't come out of Plainview. They didn't come out of a Native American segment. And they didn't come out of an alcoholic home, and I was aware of that. But he says, you can go test. I wanted to go test. It was an all-day thing. I passed. He said, the other thing you need to be aware of is that this is an 18-month program. It's rapidly paced. Typically, about 50% don't complete. And he said, you're coming in the back door as an enlisted Marine because you got to take a test. 99% of the people coming in from the street side have to have two years college minimum to get in here, and they, most of them will have more than that. So that will be your competition. So I knew that I stood a good chance of not succeeding. But I wanted to try. I came home to Wichita. They were having a powwow. I'd grown up mostly with a Kiowa family after the first divorce. And my Kiowa family called for a special uh, because I'm going to Pensacola the next day. So I went out and led the special around the arena. <clears throat> I came back. It's a routine thing that we do. But it was, it, it was special for me. And all the way to Pensacola the next day, I was, I was stricken with that. Impacted with that was great. Because I'm thinking to myself, there's no way that I can come back to this community short of completing. I cannot come back and tell them I'm back early because I didn't, I flunked out. I didn't make it. I couldn't hack it. I washed out. I thought there's no way that I can allow that to occur. And so for four, for 18 months, I was driven with that. And there were four phases of flight training at that time. And through every one of those phases, I was the number two guy. But I never got cocky or confident or complacent. I never believed I was doing as well as my grades indicated. I'm watching my friends wash out. Weekly, sometimes daily. I don't remember one of them ever coming to say goodbye to me with his sea bag over his shoulder where he looked me in the eyes. His eyes were always down. I watched him walk away, and I thought, he wants to fly as badly as I do, but his dreams are over, and I'll never see him again. And at some point, that will be me. But I continue to push ahead because I know how to work. Thanks to my parents, I know how to work, and I know how to work hard. And so I stayed with it, and I continued to do well. The last six months we left, I left the Florida area, and I went to Texas for advanced jet flight training. I got into town on August the 10th of 19, <coughs> excuse me, 1962, Friday night, 
And I hooked up with a bunch of my buddies at the officer's club, and we got rip-roaring drunk. Always got drunk. I don't remember ever drinking without getting drunk. Uh, That can't be true or I'd be dead. But I can't remember ever drinking without getting drunk. That was always where I ended up. I don't remember trying not to get drunk. The, uh, so we got pretty well ripped up, and we, they said, let's go into town. There's a little drive-in here called Cane's. That's where the good-looking South Texas girls hang out. We've got an inside track because we're going to be all hot-shot jet fighter pilots and officers. So we went in there. They went after a carload of girls. I hung back. I was never very gutsy with the gals, but I, I'm having a few drinks, and I'm rehearsing some things. I can't see the driver really good. She's at an angle. She's not talking to anybody. So I, I rehearsed about three or four things that exceeded my normal level of <laughs> cleverness. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, this is really, I got some good stuff. And I'm walking up there, and I'm thinking, she, she may even just take her clothes off sitting there. And, uh, <laughs> and I walk up, and she turns and looks at me, and she was good looking. And everything I had rehearsed left. And I don't know. <laughs> And I'm empty, and I'm standing there, and she's looking at me, and the only thing that occurs to me is those brown eyes. I said, you got the prettiest brown eyes I've ever seen, but it, it, I'd been drinking a lot and didn't come out right. I go, hey, she goes, brown eyes. And she pulled back and looked at me like I just stood there and peed on the side of her car. And, and I just turned around and walked away. I'm embarrassed. I'm, I'm thinking, that's it for me. And... Uh, So I'm standing back there drinking some more. A little while later, she got out and she went into the ladies' room. And I just got a straight shot look at her. And she had turquoise shorts on. I'm going, God darn, she's got a cute little butt. She's got pretty legs. She's got those brown eyes. And I had an AA thought. Now, I didn't know it was an AA thought. I didn't recognize it. I heard it about 29 years later. But she's walking in there, and I'm thinking, man, I want what she has. I'm willing to go to any length to get it. (laughs) And I did. <clears throat> Had a chance encounter with her the next day and just happened to be driving back to the base. I saw her going this place, and I spun in there, and I had a buddy with me. She had a girlfriend. She told me her name was Barbara, and uh, she finally, she, reluctantly, she did. And so we began to date. And um, I had never dated a girl like her before, wholesome and honest and genuine and down to earth. And uh, on February 25th, 1963, her 20th birthday, she pinned these wings on me. Right over my heart. She pinned those gold wings right over my heart. She put two gold bars on my shoulders. I'm now a commissioned Marine Corps officer, a second lieutenant fighter pilot. I had completed. I could go home. I could go home. Not only that, I had done well, and I've got this good-looking girl who likes me. So we went home to Wichita for three weeks' leave. She stayed with my sister. As the leave was coming to an end, I called her and I said, you're going back to Texas. I've got orders to California. Let's get married. And we ran down. We jumped in the car and ran down to Newkirk, Oklahoma, stood in front of a justice of peace, and we got married. Last March the 9th was 53 years. (laughs) And as, As long as she refuses to admit she made a mistake, I may have a place to stay. She joined me out in California. She was the youngest wife in the Marine Corps squadron, 20 years old. She was instantly pregnant, which I thought was part of my Marine Corps duty. And uh, <laughs> we had a little baby boy. Eight days less than a year later, we had a second one, and people come up, you guys Catholic? I go, no, we're just horny Protestants. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Vietnam was cranking up about this time, and, uh, well, shortly thereafter. And so she took the two babies and went home to Texas, and I joined my squadron, and we were one of the first Marine squadrons in Vietnam. We were flying out of a little place called Chu Lai, 50 miles south of Da Nang. A typical Marine Corps combat operation, sand, sea rations out of little cans for food, living in tents, no air conditioning, no cooling systems, no ice cubes, no cold water, no creature comforts of any kind. Off of a little runway matting, a runway that was made out of a little interconnecting matting, we had half of what we needed. But we uh, used jet assist bottles for takeoff. We're flying combat ops out of there and uh, landing in arresting gear because we were all carrier qualified, flying under some extremely challenging conditions. And I want to tell you that we acquitted ourselves extremely well. I was with 28 of the finest people. It'll ever be my lo- my privilege to be among. 
When I say 28, when I say 28, I'm talking about the pilots I got to fly with. <clears throat> I put in for a regular commission over there. I knew full well the Marine Corps did not give regular commissions to officers with no college. I got a regular commission. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's what I expect of me. That's what others expect of me. I am always supposed to achieve and accomplish. I've had a lifetime of experience doing that. I'm not supposed to go into a bar in Fargo, North Dakota and fly an airplane with seven, uh, 58 passengers drunk the next morning and become the greatest pariah in all of American commercial aviation. A joke. A public joke. Jay Leno, I made his career for weeks on end as monologues about Northwest Airlines and the pilots. He called me in June of 96 with an apology. I um, wondered why the shame had been so great for me. It's because I'd raised three kids who were grown and gone. And my theme and my standard all the time during their home, their, the time they were home, was duty, honor, country, character, honesty, integrity. You do the right thing. And in the personal example their father had just set, it rendered all of that meaningless, null, and void. And that was a knife in my heart. That hurt. That hurt. Furthermore, it's my belief that the tragedy of alcoholism is not what befalls the alcoholic. It's what I bring to my, flam my family. My wife didn't deserve it. The, the media is there. Getting, everybody's been calling her. She's being barraged by this stuff. My kids, my friends, and my family, they all get to suffer as a result of my alcoholism. And that's the tragedy. It's not what happens to me. I deserve it. I believe when you do what you did, you get what you got. That I'm responsible and I'm accountable. I'm not a victim of anything. Certainly not alcoholism, because I've done something about that. <clears throat> At any rate, we had come back from, I got out of the Marine Corps after 11 and a half years, because family separation was going to be required. I was going to miss four to six years of my kids' lives by the time I retired. That's all I want to do is be a Marine and fly airplanes. And I finally sat down and resigned. Three weeks later, I'm in class at Northwest Airlines, and I've tackled that job the same way I had in the Marine Corps. I loved what I did. I loved the people I worked with front and back. It was a fun job. Barbara had wanted a daughter. We had talked about adopting even before we got married. We had the two boys, and I said, we'll adopt. So we put in, it was a tough struggle for 14 months because we already had the two biological kids, and we fought. We went after it, and 14 months later, we bring this little Chippewa girl home. At age 17 days, she comes into my house. Most beautiful little girl I've ever seen. My two rough-and-tumble boys were my highlights, but boy, I'll tell you, nobody's ever loved a daughter like I love that little girl. I found out what daughters do to their dads, and she was the center of my universe. And she'd walk past me, and I'd scoop her up, and I'd look in that little face, and I'd say, thanks for being my girl, and she'd say, thanks for being my dad. Nobody could have loved her more than I did. And when she was 17, she ran away from home. I didn't see it coming. Barbara didn't see it coming. I don't know if I'd have seen it if I hadn't been drinking. Here's the problem with my drinking and the drunk log. I, never, I didn't drink in the mornings, and I knew all you guys drank in the mornings. So, I, <laughs> so I'm not an alcoholic. You guys talk about staying drunk for a week or three weeks. I don't do that. I can't do that. So I can't be an alcoholic. I don't drink every night. I vary my patterns. I don't get drunk every weekend, but I deliberately vary my patterns. Once, and then I devised two or three tests to see if I'm an alcoholic. I don't know anything about alcoholism, but I come up with this criteria and this data, uh, and I pass all these tests. Of course, I get in treatment, and they said, you know, most normal drinkers don't feel compelled to devise tests to see if they're normal. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. I didn't know. <clears throat> I put off being a captain for two years because I wanted to be home with my daughter. I didn't want to be gone as a junior captain. She was going to graduate and go to college, I thought. And as she's coming up towards graduation, I put in a card and go to Chicago to take a special written test to become a captain. That afternoon, when Barbara took me to the airport, Dawn and some of her friends came and got what she wanted, left a runaway note that Barbara didn't find until late that night and couldn't call me. I called home the next morning, and Barbara told me what happened. I panicked. My little girl is gone, and I don't know where she is, and I'm scared to death, and I blurt out where to go and who to call and where to look. And I get on the airplane two hours later. I'm back from Chicago. I'm in Atlanta, and someplace on that, in that two hours, something happened to me. I don't know what it was. I'm not aware of anything occurring. 
but I got off the airplane and I hated her. I hated her more than I thought I had the capacity to hate, and I mean my hatred was white hot. And I said to Barbara, I don't care if she dies in the streets. She will never come back to my home, and I never want her name mentioned in my presence for the rest of my life. And I told the family that. Within two days, there was no physical trace she'd ever been in my life because everything she had in the house that she'd ever touched or owned was gone. I went to a bank, and I ripped up her adoption papers. I went to an attorney and gave him $500 and disowned her. I tried to annul the adoption, and I couldn't. And in the blazing torrent of this white-hot hatred and this tornado activity that I was involved in, in a way that only an alcoholic can do it, I looked around and I said, huh, I don't think Barbara's handling this too well. She probably needs a therapist. So I plucked a dime out of the yellow pages, and by the luck of the draw, I got this Ph.D. family therapist, and we saw him twice a month for two years. And I didn't like talking about my daughter. And one time he was trying to get me to talk about her. I made a statement that I had never consciously formed in my mind or thought before that I was aware of. And I said to him, I said, I'm going to tell you something, doctor. I said, I would rather hate than hurt. And he said, you survived a childhood doing that, and if you continue, it'll destroy you. And everything he told us came true over time. And I got into treatment, I looked at it, I go, that's what I've always done. From the time I was little, I learned that I would never experience pain if I got angry. If I got angry quickly enough, the walls were thick enough and high enough, and pain did not penetrate my anger. So I will not be hurt. I will never make myself vulnerable to that. And that's what I saw when I got into treatment. The alcohol quit working for me. All I wanted to do now on the layovers was change clothes, get to the nearest liquor store, and I knew where they all were. I'd go back to my room. I'd lock the door, turn the TV on. I wouldn't go to the door if a crew member knocked. I wouldn't answer the phone if they called. And I would sit there and slug down a quart of booze, and I can put it down pretty fast. The problem was that I never got the effect that alcohol had once given me, that golden cloud of apathy, that I don't really care, everything's okay, screw it, I'm just do it's everything's all right. I never got that. From that time on, every time I slugged down a, hard, a bunch of booze, it was like I had a furnace in my stomach, and I'm putting gas on it because up came the hatred and the self-pity and the martyrdom, this long list of things I had done for this little girl that would never have been done if, if she hadn't been in my family. Look what I did for her, and look how she repaid me. And at the end of the bottle, by the end of the evening, I'm emotionally wasted and exhausted. I'm tired. And the next night in a different town, I will do it all over again. And the night after that, I will do it again and again and again. And it never worked for me ever again. And that's pretty much where I was when this arrest took place. I went into the treatment center, and I didn't want anybody to know who I was or where or what I was. And my eyes were down. It was a week before anybody knew the color of my eyes. But on about day two or three, the media had it. And now it's all over TV, and everybody in the treatment center knows all about me. I lost the will to live. Jay Leno's having a good time. Everybody's laughing about it. They're having a great time with it. I'm, I, I'm in this deep shame, this deep disgrace, this deep dishonor that is so foreign to me. And I, I, I don't want to live anymore. And I had those God-given moments of clarity, thanks to my fellow patients and the doctors and the counselors. And very slowly, in ways that are imperceptible, I started thinking more about living than dying. And I'm all over the TV. There are two TV sets. I won't go near either one of them. The treatment center had no, no, no visitors, no phone calls. In the first week of treatment, I walked into a day room. They closed the day room for group therapy, and there were eight or ten of us there. And for some reason I'll never understand, I began to talk, which is counterintuitive to me. And I talked about my daughter, and I didn't have that wall of pain and uh, anger anymore. And I broke down and cried. And I hadn't cried at my parents' funerals. I did not cry. My sister sent me an email a couple of years ago. She said, I grew up with you. I didn't think anything would ever make you cry. And I cried that day. And I was ashamed and embarrassed, but it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. What a breakthrough that was for me, to be able to start feeling human feelings again. And I wrote to Barbara, and I said, get a hold of Dawn. Let's put the family back together again. Because I'm in there learning about she has a right to her journey. My journey is to keep my path on, you know, I'm learning about acceptance. I'm learning about forgiveness. I'm learning about all these things that were foreign to me. The hospital heard about it and said, that's an amazing breakthrough. We'll give you a day room and let that happen if you can make it happen. 
A few days later, some days later, I walk into the day room. The two doctors are off to the side, the family therapist, the doctor had died. They said, could we please come watch this? And I walked in. I looked at my girl. And I go, God, she's smaller. And I hadn't seen her in two years, smaller than I ever remembered. I walked over and put my arms around her. My two sons are there. Barbara's there. I told her how much I loved her instead of how much I hated her. And in her arms was a five-month-old granddaughter. My daughter had gotten married, and I didn't even know her last name. I wish I could tell you that was a wonderful story, and it's got a beautiful ending. Her life is a mess today. It's just in the trash can. Um, and I, we have to let it happen. We, we know the difference between helping and enabling. Not alcohol or drugs, as far as I know. Bad life choices. We gave her a couple of magnificent opportunities to completely re reverse her life trajectory. She turned them down. So I have to let her go. I have to accept. I'll always be sad, disappointed, and heartbroken. But she has a right to her journey, and we allow her to live it. I'm sad about that. But it's no longer my way or the highway, and I don't drink over that. I don't have to drink over that. <clears throat> Things were happening in treatment. They don't want to come tell you anything, but they're having to because I'm on the TV. Now legal consequences are coming in, and they're taking me out of the group every two or three days. I never thought I would be locked up except as a POW in Vietnam if I was shot down. But now Minnesota's filed charges. Now North Dakota files charges. Now Minnesota doubles the charges. Now North Dakota doubles the charges. Now the federal marshals are coming to take me out of the treatment center in handcuffs. And they're bringing this to me every two to three days, and it stops my heart every time. It's like they suck the air out of the room, and I can't breathe for a day or so. And I'm struggling for this thing called acceptance. The last time I step outside, and there's a doctor. And I, and I thought, oh. We go down to his office, and he said, Lyles, I want you to sit down. He said, federal grand jury has just indicted you. You're looking at 15 years in federal prison, a $250,000 fine, and an attorney's coming Sunday wants $50,000. We went broke in the first 30 days. I didn't have the money. Everything was, and I, now I grew up poor, and now I've taken Barbara with me. He said, I have to ask if you're going to hurt yourself, and I said no. I went back to my room. I'm not aware of falling. I don't remember the collapse, but what I remember is lying with my face on the carpet, the side of my face on the carpet, and I'm crying for the second time in treatment. And I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I have nothing left. I can't do it even one more time. Not even one more time. Please, please help me. And I slept that night. I had life-changing experiences in treatment because I was in there wanting to believe everything that we've talked about here. I want to believe that big book. I want to believe the 12 and 12. But I need to know, does it work outside the treatment center? Does it work when I leave an AA meeting? And I think that's our only point and purpose in coming to the podium here. There are newcomers here today. And that's why I am here. So that you get a good look at up-close 3D living evidence that this program works. That what you're reading and being told, if you apply it to your life, will work. I got out of the treatment center. I was immediately in a very highly publicized three-week trial. We drew the toughest judge up there. I've got a story with an attorney that represented me that I wish I had time to share, and I don't. It's an amazing story. I wanted to plead guilty, and he said, it's not a good move. He said, your publicity is such that, that, will, that that's just not a smart thing to do at this point in time. So he said, trust me. I said, okay. He said, when you, don't, when you plead not guilty, you're not saying I didn't do it. You're exercising the constitutional right to have your accuser prove the charges. That's our best avenue. I said, okay. There was no place I could go up there. But what the media wasn't sticking cameras and microphones in my face. They had every route to and from the courthouse covered. They got me in the lunch hour. They got everything. There was nowhere I could go. I had an advantage because I'm the alcoholic of the three. And I go to meetings in Minnesota. Plymouth, Minnesota, where I was, I was living with the attorney, Barbara and I were. I go to the meetings at night, and at first I was scary because they all recognized me. And I got to sit in there, and I don't share, but I listen to you, and there's an energy and a strength in that. And I go take it to the courtroom the next day, and I get through that day in courtroom. A criminal trial is indescribable, especially one that's publicized as highly as mine was. And they're telling everybody that I'm the most worthless piece of crap on the face of the planet, always have been, always will be. The tabloids, People Magazine, all these people are picking it up and printing it. It's all over the night, and I can't do anything about it. And there are times I look across the courtroom, and Barbara would look at me, and our eyes would meet, and she'd mouth the words, I love you. And I'd nod, and I'd be okay. We'd get through that day. We drew the toughest judge up there. 
and he had strong feelings about this case, and he's entitled to them. I never, I never blamed him. This was a horrific betrayal of public trust, and I accepted full responsibility for it from day one. I never made an excuse. The jury goes out, and the jury comes back. I told my attorney, I said, okay, I'll do what you want. I said, I'm going to be found guilty, and when I am, it'll be okay. The jury goes out, the jury comes right back. I know what that means. I'm the captain. Everything comes to me first. I stand up guilty. Peter flinched. He's standing next to me. I reached over and patted him. I said, it's okay. It's okay. We go back for the sentencing. A day and a half before sentencing, my lawyer calls me and said, I've got bad news. I said, you've always got bad news. <laughs> you've never called me and said, Lyle, I've got some good news. It's always bad news. He said, the judge, the sentencing guidelines were in place 12 months to 18 months. I knew I was going to get 18 months. I was a captain. I was in treatment with a federal judge, and he said, I need to tell you some things. The sentencing is a charade. He said, notwithstanding, you'll talk, your attorney will talk. When we come through that door, the sentence is set. We never vary from the bench. Judges and other attorneys around the country have said, that is so. So I knew what the sentencing situation was going to be. But he said, the judge has just said that he's going to depart upward from the sentencing guidelines. He's notified the media and the other two attorneys, and he can go all the way to 15 years. And I'd watch this judge. I go in the courtroom. I stops my heart again. I'm telling Barbara, step one, I'm powerless. I am absolutely powerless over what's going to happen. Acceptance, surrender, that's all I've got working for me. That's all I can do. So I went in the courtroom that morning, and I knew this was going to be big. It came time to sentence me, and I stood, and he wanted to know what I had to say, and I was so scared I didn't know as I stood up what I was going to say, but I talked about being grateful to be sober. I was grateful for what had happened within my family, and I had accepted responsibility for this for day one, and I couldn't change anything, not even what had happened yesterday. So I accepted responsibility. He announced a sentence of 16 months on me, two months less under the guidelines. Blew everybody away. I'd given my personal effects to Barbara. I said, I don't think I'll come back. He'll have us led away in handcuffs for the TV cameras. He then said, this is a complex case. It was never been meant to design for pilots. It's never been used before. There'll be legal appeals. I'll let you three men remain free until your appeals are exhausted. The other two went for that. I said, no, I'll go to jail now. Why? Because I learned in here that I deal with life on life's terms. This is a first-person statement. So I always stand up here, it's I, me, I, me. It's not about I or me, never has been. It's been about we, you and me, and what you have taught me. Life on life's terms. And I'm scared. And I tell my kids, I cannot come out the back door until I go in the front. And I'm going in the front now. The judge told my attorney later, he said, I was lost for words. He said, no defendant before or since has ever done that. I was lost for words. And I looked at my attorney. I said, you wasn't lost very long. <laughs> so on December the 5th of 1990, 34 years to the day that I had entered Marine Corps boot camp, I checked into the Atlanta Federal Prison as inmate 04478-041. I served 424 days in there, one day at a time, shorter when necessary. I don't tell prison stories. I had a lot of experiences in there. Audiences love prison stories. That has nothing to do with my recovery. But my recovery has everything to do with how I dealt with prison, the people in it, the situation, circumstances, and experiences that I encountered. It has everything to do. Inmates would come up to me and say, how do you do what you do in here? How come they can't get to you? The judge put sanctions on me that were even worse than what had already happened. I forgot to tell you that a week to the day I entered into treatment, they announced on TV I'd been fired by Northwest, as I should have been. The FAA had issued an emergency revocation of all my flight certificates, which they should have done, and I'd lost my FAA medical because of my uh, alcoholism. All of it fair and appropriate. All of it fair and appropriate. There were some five or six pilots in prison who were all drug smugglers, and I was the only one who was not. I had some interesting job offers while I was in there <laughs> that didn't require an FAA ticket. <clears throat> I, um, the judge put these sanctions on me. I came out of prison. I said 424 days one time, and a guy came up to me and he says, 424 days. <laughs> he said, man, I was out there 18 years. And I just looked at him and grinned. I said, well, you win. <laughs> so, that was a long time for me. I'm not accustomed to being locked up. I like the free air that I get to breathe. So I came out of there, 
I was broke. I made 12 cents an hour in prison. Really irritated me. They had no 401k plan. Um, <laughs> the judge put these sanctions on me, never to fly again. He had permanently closed the door on me. About a year after I got out of prison, and another story I don't have time to go into, miraculously, he lifted the sanctions. Nobody thought that was possible. A nice story to that, but I don't have time for it. The FAA then said to me, if you want to fly again, you'll start literally from the ground up with a private license. None of my pilot buddies thought that was possible. Neither did I momentarily. But I thought, okay, I stay sober one day at a time. I'll go after the licenses one license at a time. That's exactly what I'll do. Ten and a half months later, I'd passed all of the written on those licenses. No quick and easy way, just hard, hard, hard work. But there's a flying part that goes with that. And that was going to cost ten to twenty thousand dollars. I didn't have it. I'm working in the treatment center now that had saved my life. I got out of prison. I went back to that treatment center working in the counseling department. I'm making fourteen thousand dollars a year, and I am grateful for that job. I am grateful to have that job, but I'm just barely staying alive. So the flying part's gone. It's a deal breaker. I'm done. I get a letter and a phone call from one of the pilots at Northwest. He said, you didn't know it, but I got a flight school. I want you to come up here and live with me and my family, go through the flight school free. I'm under 13 conditions of probation. I go up to Minnesota. I check in with the Department of Corrections up there, and I live with that man for 44 days. It rained out 14 days, but I never slowed down. I just kept studying. Flew for 30 days, and I flew 78 hours in 30 days. That's a lot of flying, a lot of flying. And I got four tickets back. I had two of them by 11.15 one morning. And I don't think that's ever been done before. I don't know, but I don't think so. When I'm not night flying, I'm in an AA meeting. Why? Because that's where I belong. That's what has brought me this far. That's what has given me life, my life back. And that's where I go. I left there. I had four tickets in my pocket. I thought, that's wonderful. But everybody, I'm the most notorious pilot in all of American aviation. Everybody knows about Lyle Prowse and Northwest Flight 650. I will never fly on American soil again, I know. But I come home, I've got those four tickets. And a month later, they physically arrive in the mail. And within an hour, I got a phone call from the head of the pilot union at Northwest. A grievance was automatically filed because of the termination. I never activated the grievance because Northwest was fair and justified in terminating me, and I wasn't going wasn't to resist it. He said, this is the best phone call I've ever made, because he said three hours ago, John Dasberg, president and CEO of Northwest Airlines, made a personal decision to bring you back and put you into full flight status at Northwest. <clears throat> when a pilot has a difficulty, it gets into trouble. If his airline is even mentioned in the newspaper, he's done. That's the fait accompli. It's done. My airline, no pilot has ever shamed or disgraced an airline like I have. It went on for weeks into months, Northwest Airlines, Northwest Airlines, and I shattered them. And he is going to bring me back and allow me to fly again. I sat there, tears streaming down my cheeks. I was unable to believe I heard what I just heard. I went back, never to be a captain again, a very emotional back-to-work agreement. We, I had wide support from the pilots and flight attendants throughout this entire time. Went back and signed a back-to-work agreement, never to be a captain again. Northwest now had a program because of the beating they'd taken over my situation, and I'm part of that program working with young pilots and my older pilots and watching families get saved and careers get saved and lives get saved. I retired. Well, I was coming up on retirement. I had one year to go. I was speaking at United Airlines. I get a phone call late at night, and the pilot says, John Dasberg, just changed your back-to-work agreement. He knows you're coming up on your last year, and when you come home, he wants you to check out as a 747 captain. I lay, I, Barbara, was, Barbara was with me. I lay there in the dark. room was very dark, and I lay there for a long time because I thought nothing will ever surpass or exceed my return to Northwest. And now I'm going to be a captain again. And I, I, I lay there in the dark, and I had this feeling that God was looking down and grinning and winking and saying, every time you think I've used my miracles up, I'll show you one more. <laughs> and I thought, man, I can't wait for the next one. So I went back, and I checked out, and I completed my last year at Northwest in the left seat of a 747, fully restored, and we never recaptured the, the incredible financial losses, but I wouldn't trade anything. Fully restored, fully trusted, given back that golden gift. 
that you can only value once you've lost it. Trustworthy. I was trustworthy to fly a mega million dollar airplane, 18 flight attendants, 400 passengers all over the world because I was a sober member of AA. Only for that reason. I have no qualities that other people in this room don't have. I am just a member of AA who got a home group, got a sponsor, worked the steps, and did everything I was told to do one day at a time. I retired there. John Dasberg had really gambled his career because if I had gone back and relapsed, the board of directors would have ousted him instantly after all the publicity for allowing me to do that a second time. And I talked with him about that. I said, why would you do that? I would never have done that. I had an amazing relationship with this man. I saw him every once a year for almost five years. Go and talk to him. He called me in. I retired, and my goal was to make sure he never regretted bringing me back. I dedicated myself to that, and I know I did a good job. I retired honorably in 1998 at the age of 60. It's now 65, and I know I've done a good job. Within two days of my retirement, my lawyer called me. He said, Judge Rosenbaum just called him. He's now chief judge. This is eight years after the trial. He's now chief judge. Minnesota Federal District says he has never, ever supported a petition for pardon in 16 years on the bench, but he'll support yours if you want to make the attempt. I had never even considered such a thing. The judge wrote a three-page affidavit that is so emotionally, chokingly powerful that to this day I can't read it all the way to page three without tearing up. This is what the man who tried me, sentenced me, and sent me to prison says in this affidavit about me. The power of this program. I have no power like that. The best part of my story is I get no credit for it. Other than suiting up and showing up, I had no control over these events. Not the good ones, not the bad ones. Paperwork went in. I came walking in two years later, and there were eight phone messages telling me I just received a presidential pardon. That's mega huge. That's life-changing for a federal felon. Amazing. We read the promises here a little while ago. I sat my second day in treatment, I heard the promises read my head down. And I perked up a little bit and thought, well, maybe there's something to this. And then they said, no matter how far down the scale we've gone, I tuned it out. I said, it may be true for you and it may be true for her, but that will never be true for me. And you have not heard, even in this period of time, 30% of the entire story and the miracles that I have been blessed and graced to live through. I want to close with something that I really love because it addresses life as I understand it. It simply says this, I did not wish you te uh, joys without a sorrow, nor endless day without the healing dark, nor brilliant sun without the restful shadow, nor tides that never turn against your bark. I wish you faith and strength and love and wisdom and goods, gold enough to help some needy one. I wish you songs, but also blessed silence and God's sweet peace when every day is done. My Comanche name is Yatsat Danap, but you know me as Lyle, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm so happy that I got to share the evening with you. Thank you. Thank you for my sobriety. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.